Hello and welcome back to Prom Circle where we discuss AI use cases and how to implement them. Uh, we typically cover tutorials on how to build different types of applications, uh, typically in tools like Slack, uh, where you can get um, your AI applications directly to users immediately if you're trying to test them out. So I have several videos like that uh, talking about those things. In today's video, we're going to be talking about the latest AI model that has hit the scene. The next one that is laying the claim to the throne that OpenAI already uh, kind of sits on. Um, and that is Google Gemini. And it's um, really exciting to see this. I think there are some interesting and um, exciting things to look at when using this particular model. So we're just gonna be taking a very first look at the model and how it works, uh, some of the key functionality. I'm also gonna show you very quickly how to get it into Slack so that you can start deploying applications quite quickly uh, using the model. So I am on the Google uh, landing page for this via Vertex AI. So there, you, you know, there is a, an actual website, the Gemini website and things like that, which is where you could go access it, but I'm accessing it directly from Google Cloud itself and um, through the Vertex AP, um, AI um, service. So you could see right here, I think what they're doing basically is introducing this new multimodal concept. Multimodality really simply means that the AI model is not just um, taking text input um, that these large language models are taking much more than that. They're taking um, input like images and videos, uh, voices, things like that. And I think it's something we've seen with OpenAI already uh, with the GPT-4 vision, which is able to also do the same. It can ingest uh, images, but I think where Google has uh, stepped it up, obviously is adding some video um, capabilities. Um, let's take a look at uh, some of the things here that they're talking about and basically, like I said, multimodal uh, functionality is something that is big with this particular large language model. It comes in two forms. Currently, there's a Gemini Pro, which is just basically for text-based tasks. So if you're doing, um, you know, sort of using the regular large language model to generate text, generate code, things of that nature. Um, you're using Gemini Pro. And if you're using Gemini Pro Vision, then that's where the multimodal prompts come in. So you can include both text and images. I'm gonna make um, a separate video talking about uh, the, the Gemini Pro Vision specifically uh, to kind of look at how to make these different prompts that contain just modern text themselves. So they also kind of talk about some of the you know key things that are big use cases for Gemini. I think most of them are pretty much stuff we've seen with OpenAI in the past. So information seeking, so combining world knowledge with information from images and videos. Um, object recognition in images. I think this is sort of GPT 4V. Um, digital content understanding. So answer questions by extracting uh, information from content like infographics, chats, and things like that, which is pretty cool. I mean, I, I, you know, it's really cool that you can do this. But like I said, you can do this in GPT um, as well in um, OpenAI GPT as well. Um, they also do have. Um, start to talk about extraction of um, responses or output from the model in specific formats like HTML and JSON. And I think this is one of the most important things about LLMs uh, while using them in production. So um, as someone who has really done a lot of work deploying LLMs to production itself, uh, one of the key things that you start to find out is that LLMs can be unpredictable. So for you to use them properly, you always want to make sure that they're returning the responses in predictable formats. And this is why they talk about structured content generation. So I want to return the information in JSON and CSV or whatever it is. So they do support, um, you know, kind of structuring the responses in that strict output. Uh, one of the other things that they added, which is uh, a little subtle, they haven't really, um, you know, made a lot of bones about this, is function calling. And this is probably something that is pretty important. I think it is about being able to use outputs that come from the responses from the LLM to make calls to other other functions. So. 
For instance, you might want to interact with the weather API, I think, which is something they've used as an example here, which we can just very, very briefly look at, but I'm gonna make a video on this um, specifically. I just made one video on this for OpenAI, which I'm gonna be releasing for the OpenAI Assistant. Uh, where I talk about function calling. So I'm gonna do the same thing uh, for this. But basically what it is, is like if for instance, you build an application that is gonna be interacting with an API or interacting with your own functions, you know, can you use the model to generate the inputs for your function? So as an example, if you were to be, um, you know, getting the current weather of a place and you, you, you are supposed to be hitting the weather API to get that, when someone asks a question saying, oh, I want to know, um, you know, what the weather is like today uh, in a specific city, you're able to extract key information from that text and that forms the input that you may use to call the, the weather API to return the response back to the user. So function calling is a very, very powerful thing. It really starts to ground your, your large language model, your agent, your assistant, whatever it is, in the processes and the business processes that are within your use cases. So they now have access to your functions, which means that they can do some really interesting things. However, we're gonna do a whole video on it um, where I will go into function and show you a few examples of how uh, this can be used in real world uh, use cases. So now let's jump straight into Vertex AI and go right into multimodal. So the inside the Vertex AI studio, you can go into multimodal and this is how you get access to Gemini. Um, so they show some examples here and I think it's always great to start with some of the examples that they have shown here. So this is extracting text from images. So inside this particular prompt, they, they provide an image of a, um, a picture that contains some text that is handwritten and they provide a prompt that says, read the text in, the mess in this message and provide a response. So. Over here, you can see that right here, the model is Gemini ProVision. So this is very, very similar to sort of, you know, what we've seen in in, in the other um, Palm models as well. So, you know, it's the same interface basically. So there's a region, there's a model, there's a temperature, and then there's a token limit. I believe G uh, Gemini has a 32K uh, token window. I think that's what it's working with. And then you have other things here, safety settings, um, if you want to block some um, hate speech or dangerous content. So they put some sort of privacy capabilities in here, which could be uh, quite useful. Uh, then under advanced, you can see, um, you know, some of the responses, uh, you know, your top K, top P, those type of um, controls are over there as well. Um, so right now, if you just hit the submit button, then it starts to generate the response. There is an option here for you to mark this in Markdown so it returns the response much better. So if we open our response, it says the best dreams when you are awake. And that's what this image is. The best dreams happen when you're awake. Okay, so it's able to kind of e extract uh, text uh, from images. And I, I don't think this is anything too wild. I think we've seen this with GPT-4V already. We've seen it with other models that can do this uh, pretty easily. But I think what, what's amazing about it is that it's built natively into uh, this model as well. So you provide the image and I think you can provide up to 16 images at any given time and it provides you back responses um, as well. So uh, let's go check out a few other um, examples which they have provided. Um, so continue. Um, so they provided this few shot image to Jason. So basically you provide a few examples um, of how you want the outputs to look like. So in this case, you see this image uh, of Rome um the colosseum in rome sorry and then it says i want the response back in in json right so that's the important thing here and it gives like i think three or so examples and then when you pass your um requests now it's going to be able to return that response back in json format as was uh, provided here. So you see City, Rio de Janeiro, uh, Landmark, Christ the Redeemer, which is correct. And it provides that response in JSON. Now these responses in JSON are really, really powerful, like I said, because it gives you like the right outputs to use um, 
you know, as an input in something else. Say, say you wanted to store this in a database or you just wanted to, to use it as an input for a function. It, it's really easy to, to take out the key value pairs and, and, and stuff like that. So that's a very, very key thing that is very important when you're deploying some of these large language model uh, applications inside production. All right. So essentially that's uh, one of the, the main things that they've shown us here. It's really about the pairing of text and images i think the rest of the stuff is you know pretty standard stuff that you could uh get from gpt um v as well and then we have the video ones as well so add a copy from the video so it looks at the video and basically uh can generate a response about the video so provide a tourism ad you know for this video and it will just basically generate some ad copy uh, for that video based on you know what the, what it's seen in the video and basically what it's looking at is all the frames of the video and uh, and piecing all of that together and then using that to you know, generate this this ad copy as you can see here. So um, essentially that's 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 those are the key things I would say that have come out from uh, Gemini. I, all right, so let's go back into one of these prompts and see how you can actually use this inside code. So let's go with this very uh, simple one here, which is extract text from images. And basically when you open this prompt, you can view, you can get the code right here. So we can get the code right here and see, you know, how you can use this. And it's very easy to use this. Basically, um, you know, you, you use it very, very similar to how you use Palm, the Palm model as well. And I made a video about it. I'll put it in the description as well. You can use it to kind of get a, a sense of how to do the whole setup. If you want to set it up uh, for, you know, your Slack application or any other application you want to set up. Um, so how to kind of make sure that you can, you can actually reach this API. And there's a little bit of setup you need to do in Google console as well as, um, you know, kind of getting your keys and all of that stuff. So I've already you know, made a video about that and I'll share that uh, with you. So basically you can see it's a very simple function. You declare the model uh, in the responses, you pass the messaging. So the image is passed as something that is a combination of base64 encoded image data and the MIME type. So is it PNG, JPG, whatever it might be you pass those inside this array. So this array is basically where they're called parts, um, which is where you kind of pass the inf the right information about of, you know, from your prompt. So anything from your prompt is, is actually just going into this, um, into this list. Now you have a generation configuration where you can set your maximum output tokens, your temperature, top P, top K, things like that. If you want to stream the responses back, you can set that to true or false. And then to get the response, you're going to be looking inside the candidates object. And in there, you're going to be looking for the content parts dot text. And that's how you return uh, the response back. So it's a pretty straightforward thing. And I'm going to show you very, very quickly. Take a look at how to build out a Slack application that uses Vertex AI um, as its um, bot agent. So here we're going to be using Vertex AI. So I do provide all the uh, details on how to uh, do this also in my github page for this uh, which also contains all of this code so which you can you know use uh, directly um so but you need the vertex ai and you need slack bolt so you need slack bolt to uh, power your slack application um, that other video also includes um, how to set up the slack application itself Okay, so next up, we want to create the function that actually interacts with our Vertex AI model. Um, and to create that function, we need uh, to pass text. That's the attribute we're passing into the function. So text would be, you know, questions coming from your user or any other information, context, things of that nature that you want to pass. You can pass right in there or images, things of that nature. Um, in terms of um, how we kind of use this. We pass these inputs over over to the model um, and then we pass some sort of our configuration items. So number of output tokens, temperature, things of that nature. So very similar things that you see in OpenAI. 
Uh, and then uh, in terms of the responses that we get back, we're looking for the candidates.content.parts.text that is the actual response that we, we get back from the model. So we return that response. So now to use this in a Slack application, we just have our Slack message handler here, which is listening for any message. So this is for direct messages. So here we have our message handler. We're passing in, we're basically getting the message. We're using the save function, which is just a way to reply back. And we're using the ACK, which is just basically an acknowledgement um, of the event on the Slack side. So when we get the message from Slack, uh, from Slack uh, we make a call to our generate function to pass that uh, text uh, to Gemini. Gemini provides a response and we send that response back. Now we're treading that response, which is why we're using the tread underscore TS, which allows you to tread um, messages. So that's basically all there is to it. And we are initializing our app because it's in socket mode. We're using the socket mode handler here to initiate our app. So you need your Slack bot token and Slack app token for this. Like I said, I've kind of provided a full setup video which you can use to set this up uh, from scratch. So once we have that running and we run our code, now we can jump into Slack and see how it actually works. Uh, tell me how to write a Slack application using the Slack Bolt library. Show how I can handle um, a direct message. So let's just ask that question. So this, this should be for generating some code. So we should get in our response the code uh, for doing that. So this is simple, you know, code generation type stuff. So it provides us with sort of the step-by-step -step for how to create a Slack application, provides us with sort of how to do it. So it is defaulting to, to um, the JavaScript. And I didn't make any sort of indication what I wanted, but it's doing the JavaScript version of it. And it's also providing um, this in really good markdown, I should say as well. All right, so there we have it. This is, um, you know, just pretty straightforward. Like I said, I'm going to be um, making another video on how you can send the images across uh, when you want to, um, you know, use it within Slack. So I will, you know, show you how to do that. And also we'll look at function calling in Gemini as well in the next video. If you are excited about um, this kind of stuff, uh, feel free to actually subscribe and you know check out my older videos where I've done so many other videos talking about how to build all sorts of Slack applications using um, these large language models. Until next time, see you later, bye.